And I'm going to run through this a little bit quickly just so we have time for the demo at the end. It's a fairly short demo. Um, but when we talk about ETA, right, and crypto traffic analysis, um, to take a step back, I guess, you know, there's, I think, this this issue that's on everybody's mind and, and um, when you talk about encrypted traffic, depending on what, you know, source of information you want to look at, and, you know, the 70% of all statistics are made up, the truth of the matter is that right, traffic is being encrypted more and more every day. Um, and overall, that's a really good thing. Like, I, it, you know, if you think about why do we use encryption, um, it allows us really to do business that we, and live our lives that we do today in this kind of connected age. You know, would you feel safe banking online um, without encryption? Would you feel safe <laughs> shopping from your phone without encryption, right? So you might not see the widespread adoption of like mobile and cloud services if it wasn't for encryption, which is why we're seeing, I think, more and more of an increase. Plus, there's always consumer privacy issues um, that are going to going to be different depending on where you are in the world, especially. But as security practitioners, it's a slight double-edged sword because as this traffic kind of goes dark, we also know that attackers that are trying to infiltrate your network are exploiting right, those ill-gained assets are using encryption as well to evade detection. Um, so what we're really looking at here with, with the encrypted traffic analysis is trying to do some kind of SSL inference right, and, and classify traffic as potentially right, benign or malicious based off of indicators within the um, kind of TLS handshake. So we're not decrypting it, right? And that's the important part here is that we are not decrypting this traffic um, because there's, there's, right, once we decrypt it, we have all of our security tools at our fingers that we want to use, um, but it's not always legal to decrypt the traffic. It's not, it'll break certain applications to decrypt it. Um, and, um, what was I looking for? <laughs> Anyway, so there, there's certain reasons you don't want to decrypt um, all of that traffic. It's going to create additional overhead, not only for processing, like say on the proxy or the firewall that you're doing it on, but also overhead for managing things like certificates. Uh, it's a lot of overhead, you know, just the, the infrastructure side of things. Uh, I really don't enjoy PKI very much. And so with each of those um, kind of exceptions you're making, again, for legal reasons, for applications, certain things like that, each one of those will create a loophole, right, or a hole in, in that entire kind of security processing. And all the attackers know that, you know, this is being done. So they're going to exploit those as well. So effectively, you know, what else can we do besides just proxying and do kind of man in the middle um, type of SSL decryption? Because with, with ETA, what we're really looking at doing is kind of trying to get back some visibility um, by exposing malicious connections. And really what we're looking at for this first iteration is really connections to CNC servers and botnets. Again, using um, some inference there. So not just based off of IP or URL. Because again, as you, you know, we start moving into things like TLS 1.3, we're not able to see the URL that it's being connected to. So even things like, you know, SEC Intel aren't as effective for that type of traffic. So, right, just trying to gain some visibility back. Then also, you know, again, kind of went through this when I talked about the false positive ratios. Again, this is a machine learning technology. And so as we were developing this, we aimed for absolutely zero false positives. And so far, that's what we're, we're still at. Of course, as you as we start to kind of let this go in the wild, we're going to have to probably tune things to keep that rate. But we want to make sure that as we're doing this, we're really providing high fidelity signals for anybody that's ever worked in a, in a SOC. How many alerts do you get a day? How many can you actually deal with? How many are false positives, right? We take you know, all of those problems, we're gonna make sure that if we're providing you a signal that it's, um, that it's good, right? That you can trust it, you can take it to the bank and actually do something actionable with it. And so we do that by again, kind of tuning the machine learning model right to that level, but also incorporating other um, signals for verification so that you can actually take response on your network using those events, whether it be through our gear, through third-party products as well, because why we love everybody to be an all Juniper shop that's not realistic. Um, <laughs> and we really don't believe in vendor lock-in, going back to the automation piece and kind of where um, Juniper grew up out of with, with, with you know, Junos being completely open and API-driven. Um, so it kind of enables you to maximize your ROI based and, and again, leverage whatever tools are in your toolbox already, and then add new ones as time goes on. So kind of how this works with a little bit more detail is um, what we're looking at is kind of two things, metadata and then connection behavior. So by metadata, we mean 
information stored within the TLS handshake, so it's just things like connection details, uh, cipher suites being used, uh, packet length, the handshake link, the SSL extensions, right? So there's a number of, of pieces of information we're going to collect. And then from there, we'll ship that off to the cloud, have it analyzed. And on the outset, right, from that machine learning model, we get an idea of is, is this likely to be a benign or malicious connection to like a CNC server or a botnet. And so a little bit more detail, there's kind of three parts to it. Just like with the, the malware analysis, there's kind of a multi-stage analysis that happens. We have the same thing going on with ETA, where at the very beginning, what we're doing is looking for known malicious activity. So we actually have a feed of known um, SSL certs that are used like with known botnets, things like that. Um, this comes from a number of different places, including, again, our own threat researchers. So they, we have a number of threat researchers around all over the globe, as well as a bunch of honeypots. So if, say, they discover some new botnet that's propped up and it's using this specific SSL cert, we add that to that feed. That feed is dynamically updated and given to the SRX on a regular basis. And the SRX just keeps a cert hash locally. So when that connection starts, right, it's going to go out no matter what. It's allowed out. But when we get the response from the server back, if it's using a known kind of malicious cert, we can actually do inline blocking at that point. Connection stops, you're good to go. Now, for anything that we don't know is malicious, that's where we have to, again, do some of the machine learning. So we're collecting all of that TLS kind of metadata, sending that off to the cloud to be inspected. And then on the back end, we can kind of automate that and, and, and automate the, the remediation of those events. <laughs> a question, um, does SRX also parse, analyze the HTTP2 binary feeds for this? So, can you... so traditionally you have got HTTP, HTTPS, and HTTP2 is a binary protocol. Is SRX actually analyzing those binary requests? That So that's something that the, the initial um, offering, right, is just going to do HTTP. And, well, HTTPS, I should say. We're actually looking at how do we implement this with HTTP2, and um, that'll be, you know, kind of further down the line. So this is the first iteration. Yeah, there's definitely a lot more. There's some tuning that probably has to happen, right, to be able to handle HTTP2. Um, so at a high level, right, the first step is the traffic goes out to the server. Once we receive a response from that server, this is where the SRX is going to do the SSL, right, just cert check against the, the hash of known bad certificates locally. If it matches, at that point, we just shut down the connection. We're good to go. If not, we move on to kind of stage three. We start collecting right, the, the TLS metadata as well as some connection statistics. All that information is sent up to the cloud to be analyzed. And then if it is deemed malicious at that point, that's where we kind of um, will you know, pot potentially add that host to the infected host list and block the traffic on the firewall or even further down, right, if, if we have any of the other um, connections set up, like to the cloud, to our switches, routers, things like that. So here's how this works from the, right, so there's just our, our cloud portal. And you can see here the host, the threat level is at zero, so they're not on the infected host feed at this point in time. We're going to log into the SRX, and you'll just kind of see how the um, metadata is actually collected. So it's the metadata streaming service that actually allows this information to be collected on the firewall. So you can see here that nothing has been inspected so far, nothing has been detected. And then we're going to go ahead and actually start right, the malicious traffic. So this is just using TCP replay with some PCAPs. We, <laughs> we were hoping to do this live today, but the PCAPs were not working. So I think we're going to figure out what's going on there. Um, so at this point, we're just going to write refresh every 10 seconds to see. Now, as these PCAPs are going through, you can see that there's two sessions that have been inspected. We haven't seen a submission quite yet. So I think, yep, on the next refresh, you can see here, we do have one now successful submission. Three in sessions have been inspected. And now what we're waiting for is a detection. And you can see here now that the um, one session has been detected, right? So that's a malicious session, so that detection is. So three inspected, one of the three has right, been detected as potentially malicious. So if we go back to the ATP portal, you can see here now the threat level has actually been raised to five. 
think on to encrypted traffic analysis, we can see here that that right host has actually hit the use that same connection with right, the same connection patterns a couple times now. Each individual event has a threat level of 10, which is probably why their their overall threat levels at a, at a five now, because there's been multiple instances of this. Um, you can download the PCAP to see more information about this. So if we open up the PCAP here in Wireshark, I think is what happens. You can see, yes, it, it is actually SSL traffic um, and we're not decrypting anything. Everything is still encrypted beyond that point. You can also take a look at the certificates so you can see it right there in the browser or you can download the certs. And again, for somebody doing like forensics, um, an incident response, they may need these extra details. So all that information is available. If you wanna know more about why this was potentially met, like flagged as malicious. And then the last thing I'll look at here is you can just create a whitelist for the encrypted traffic analysis function and whitelist certain right, uh, IPs to not ever be inspected. So if you have like maybe some application that looks malicious right, that you know your, your devs are working on um, and it keeps flagging it, we could easily whitelist things like that. And that's that's the, the, the bulk of the demo there. Since so it's kind of short demo, this feature is slated to come out at the end of June with our 20.2 release. Would you have to whitelist the entire IP or could you actually whitelist certain things? So right now it's just the IP and that's because again with certain types of you know if you look at like say TLS 1.3 the URL isn't visible in the clear so the only thing we can really see without decrypting the traffic is the IP. That's fair that's fair I just I don't know whitelisting that <laughs> kind of scares me but but no I, I get that that makes sense. The other thing I was going to ask about which might be a bit backwards from your last um, demo but hopefully okay, is um can I a lot of this data is, you know, really, really interesting, but I'd like to be able to like, um, you know, can I, can I send it out to something like Splunk to then analyze it um, on my own kind of my own yeah. uh, reporting and that sort of thing. Um, and is it, is it like, how would I do that? Is it something I can do um, built in or is it something that I have to send out through, um, I guess REST API, you, you make use of that a lot, don't you? <laughs> Yeah, so it, it depends on what, what you want. And that's <laughs> the good and bad thing I think with Juniper overall is we allow, we have a lot of flexibility. So with this solution specifically and anything within the ATP kind of sphere, because the SRX is initially the kind of collection point for both files and that, that metadata, um, all of the information going back and forth between the SRX and the cloud is all, they're all there in log messages. So yeah, if you wanna send your log messages, right, just basic syslog, uh, if you want to send those to your sim, whether it be, you know, Splunk or you could, you know, ElkStack, whatever it is you're using to kind of manage logs, um, that's all possible. And then if you wanted to pull, say, extra information, um, things that aren't available necessarily in the logs, like download, say, the certificates or those PCAPs, you could easily do that via the API. So I think it really right. depends on how much data um, your analyst wants. Yeah, no, that's fair. In, um... <sighs> No, okay, never mind. <laughs> that, that makes sense, sorry. Okay. Um, at the risk of uh, a reducto ad absurdium, i uh, just kind of trying to wrap my head around the whole thing um, and looking at kind of the history of Juniper coming to this point. It, it sounds like, we're, you know, to put, a, like I said, a, a, a balloon over the whole thing here, we've kind of migrated from, I think what you used to call the software-defined secure network and, and instead really talking about Juniper Connect security now. And the main pieces are the ATP, um, which, which is the collector and does all this analysis and everything, and then the policy enforcer, which can push that out to EX, MX, I'm guessing QFX as well, yep. so that's kind of missed, all that things. I mean, that, that's kind of the, the basic machinery of this whole thing, right? Yep. Yep, absolutely. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. That's a good summary of it all. <laughs> yeah, well put. <laughs> yeah, pretty good. Thanks. Yeah, and I said, you know, bringing, going back to like the, the old kind of where this all started from, um, you know, it was kind of an individual use case where that would be interesting to start to integrate, you know, just our switches, but that really grew and, and the policy enforcer and then the ATP portion, which is kind of the detection mechanism where the policy enforcers are enforcement uh, piece, right, allows us to really kind of spread 
you know, our data goes to every other device within the network and not only gather intelligence from it, but be able to mitigate using it. And that and that's really where the messaging changes as well, right? From a what I consider to market texture, especially as an engineer, <laughs> we we slid SDN apart and stuck another letter in there. Uh, now to actually something that's a strategy with proof points. I have I have just a small question. I didn't saw Google Cloud on on the slides. Any plans for integration for Google? Yes. Uh, great question. Uh, we actually do have uh, instances in Google. Uh, I just haven't gotten them running in my demo. So. so it's already fully supported? I want to say yes, but I haven't tried out the Google Cloud integration myself. The AWS and Azure connectors are much more mature uh, compared to the Google Cloud. OK, fair. Yeah, I'm, I'm assuming ETA works on non-standard ports for HTTPS, as long as it's HTTPS type of traffic. Correct. Yeah, and the, the nice thing too at ETA is it just, again, as long as you have an SRX in a connection to the cloud, it's, it's fairly simple and easy to set up. 